I would say leading from the heart is the best way to live. Leading from the heart. Wow, that's beautiful. And I can truly see how you're doing that with your life because you're, you know, the Bible says that by your works, you will notice them. And that's exactly what you're doing. This podcast is brought to you by ISU Corp. Are you having trouble with your software projects? Is there a project that's taking too long or a technology you can't handle? We can help. We are ISU Corp, experts in custom software since 2005. With almost 20 years of experience, we can solve any technical problem from new businesses to satellite software. We've done it all. Let us turn your ideas into reality. Learn more about how we can help by visiting us at www.isucorp.ca. Your solution starts here. Hello and welcome to another episode of uh, the Break Free Podcast. I am your host, David Mansella. As everybody knows, this podcast is dedicated to shining the light on people that are really making a difference in our days, especially in these days that seem to be getting harder and darker. Uh, Brent, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you, David. I'm excited to be on your show. Uh, Brent, for the audience, can you give me your full name? Where do you live and what do you do for a living? Yeah, my name is uh, Brent Pullman, CEO of Midwest Laboratories. We are a full analytical testing lab. Um, we have 300 employees and we're in three verticals, animal health, human health, and agriculture and environmental. We do testing on a large scale basis and we process a number of samples. And uh, when we receive samples, typical turnaround is three to five days. We get the uh, analysis information back to our companies and owners of those samples and uh, they can make managerial decisions based on those numbers. And that's why I was so excited to do your podcast. As you know, my business was created from a laboratory, uh, one of the largest laboratory in Canada. And, and uh, to be honest with you, it was one of the hardest jobs that I ever had. And uh, it's funny because once I conquered the lab science together with computer science, my company started to thrive. And now I still do run, you know, I create uh, laboratory management systems for multiple laboratories. But it was very hard. I mean, like computer science is hard enough and then put it on top of that chemistry and lab science and you have the perfect storm. So I have a lot of respect for people that runs laboratories. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think you, yeah, a lot of people don't understand what you just said there, but it is so true. It is definitely, there's a lot of moving pieces to this and um, it has been fun to watch it all come together, but yeah, definitely a lot of moving pieces. Another thing that is surprising, Brent, having 300 employees in a laboratory is not normal. I mean, most labs run with 20 people, 15 people, and they have very specific type of testing. Uh, for example, in, in back, back where we live, we have uh, medical labs and most of them are independent and they are like, you know, uh, smaller shops, if you will. How do you make it to become such a large organization? Yeah, so my father founded the company in 1975 on agricultural testing and it was on soil and for growers, farmers, and it just kind of really ballooned. I, I came back to the business in 2005, and that's about the time Precision Ag really took off. So soil samples like um, for growers, after their harvest, they'll, they'll sample their soil and apply one more uh, fertilizer application before winter. And so now um, I, can, I can tell you, we are probably the largest soil testing lab in the country. Uh, we get anywhere from in between October and December, every single day, we get about 15,000 to 40,000 soils a day we receive. Wow. So th to do that, you have to have a lot of people. We, uh, we're not going to, um, there's no way you can, um, you have to individually scoop those samples. So you need people. Um, we don't have, a. we have automated some processes, but you still need a fair amount of people to, do, to get that happen. Um, on the animal side, we get about 1,000 to 2,000 feed and pet food samples a day, all year round. So again, these are large volumes, large um, numbers of samples that we get in different areas. And then on the food and micro side, depending on that, it, it continues to grow, but we probably, I would say anywhere to 100 to 500. Some of that micro work is even being done on pet food. A lot of it now is done on pet food, but 
Um, the scalability, you need those numbers again if you're going to bring in um, uh, a number of employees of 300. And we've only done that here in the last five years. That was again that whole part of transitioning where my dad ran a lean and mean shop and up until 2018 we had 110 people. So we've gone from in 2000, 100, 2018, 110 to almost 300 here in 2024. That's beautiful. And, and uh, kudos to that success. I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy for sure. Yeah. When I got, so I got hired by this lab to change the, the database infrastructure because they were doing, they, this is what was happening to them, right? They, they were a small lab and they started doing merges and acquisitions with other labs. And all of a sudden they had, you know, I think they had like two, 300 people and they couldn't handle it anymore. And little did I know what I was getting myself into because it quickly became a 2,000 people organization, coast to coast, and uh, it was hard. And in between all that, Brent, I don't know if you remember, but we had a crisis in Canada where some uh, a municipality from a township, the water got contaminated and about five people died wow. from E. coli. And uh, that's what spun off our water testing uh, facilities. Uh, we didn't do water testing as much before. And because of this, it was the, the town of Walkerton that had this problem. This lab wanted the bid to start testing water for all mun municipalities. So when we're talking about la labs, we're talking about saving lives too, isn't oh, it? It is. I think, and our people are, I really feel like uh, purposeful, especially, you know, like you said, on the microbiology side um, or on the food side. I mean, soil, water plants, we deal with the America's food source and uh, in, the, in the world from different, we get samples from Canada, Mexico, as well as other countries too. So you're absolutely right. Oh yeah, it's definitely purposeful and life-saving. For sure. So Brent, tell me, um, one of the hardest things for a business is to become a multi-generational family business. I tell you that because I'm experiencing that myself. It's very hard for me to entice my kids to get involved into the business. And you just mentioned that you came back to the company. So let's look back to the beginning. You were growing up, your dad was running this lab. What happened when you were in high school? Yeah, no, I was working. Um, I started at the age of 15. And then I would come after school. I would I would help like clean up, wash wash glassware, that those types of things. Did that all through high school, college, and then after I graduated from college, my dad told me he said we kind of had a pact. He said I need you to go away from here. I need you to go into the corporate world and really see if you can make it on your own. I want your I want you to be independent. I want you relying on me. And that was the best advice he could give me. So I taught for five years. I worked in the cor in different corporations from uh, Mutual of Omaha, HDR, Arthur Anderson. And then um, when the time was right, I came back and he was absolutely right. If I wouldn't have had that experience to go out and, and see something for myself, I would have always wondered what that was like um, staying, staying here all the, my whole life. So I think that was really important for me to get out and see a different whole view of the world. And then bring those skill sets back uh, in the areas of technology, accounting, um, marketing, and uh, management. So I, th I think that was really um, a good thing to do. And I have the same issue, I shouldn't say same issue, same thing too with my kids. I don't know, my kids are all in their 20s. Uh, I mean, I was, I was 40 when I came back, so they have some time. They're all pursuing their own careers right now. And it's, it's a, it's a it's a cycle that we definitely have to go through all the time and we can talk about that more but yeah i totally it i i think it's it's hard it's a challenge but it's um it's a constant communication i would say so you left the business for 20 years to be incorporated yes wow that was a long time and tell yeah. me what did you go to school for so i went to school I, I knew i wanted to teach i also knew i wanted to get into a corporation so i taught for a couple a uh, couple years then i went back got my mba and it, this was in the 90s and then worked as i said i worked for these corporations and um, i was putting in a ton of hours i was putting you know 10 to 12 hours that was the only way i thought i could get noticed in these different corporations and then when the opportunity came back with my dad and his two partners um there was from 2005 to 2016 that was a real learning piece for me you know being in that kind of setting with my dad and his two partners so i really needed to see that firsthand but i think i needed to 
see it from the outside coming in first versus always just kind of working here um, th through high school and college. It was a totally different experience at that time. Uh, you know, Brent, I truly, uh, I truly can see how your corporation grew up because you could see outside of the box because you had to go outside of the box to see outside of the box. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. What what uh, what title did you get when you came back? Right. So after? I came back and I was in marketing. So it was a perfect time to be in marketing. Google was coming out, websites, uh, e-commerce. It was a very exciting time from 2005. The iPhone. Um, 2005 to 2015 was it was a fun time to be in marketing and uh, really kind of continue to grow. So I really got an appetite for growing the business. And at the same time, I saw my dad and his two partners, they're reaching, they're in their 60s and 70s. And they were really excited how they'd worked their whole lives and they'd seen this company grow and it was very profitable. And they they liked everything and they they had no reason to change anything. So that was really the mindset at that time that they just liked how things were going. And um, they got they were very comfortable with the way things were going at that time. How many people were you guys back then in 2005? Uh, 2005, we were probably about 85, 90 people. Right. Very Maybe stable business, one. bringing in some revenue. The EBITDA looked fine. Everything was running smooth and it was boring, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> they loved it. I mean, they did. They really, I mean, they, they saw their hard work pay off. Because I remember in 1975, it was two people. You know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the 80s, it was grown to about three to 50 people. Um, so they'd seen over the years how how it had grown. So they were very, I mean, as anybody would be watching that kind of grow from the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s. You know, and this is one thing that my audience needs to know. Success is not built overnight. It no. takes a long path, commitment, and it takes it, it takes guts to go through everything until you finally get there. And once you get there, it's a different ballgame. Once you're successful, you need to maintain being successful and continue growing. Otherwise, you're going to die again, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think that's what happened. In 2015, we started to kind of level out. And of course, me being from the outside, I want to change fast. I want to change a thousand miles an hour. And to your point with the, the whole, you know, like the limb system and building up systems, we were growing, we needed better systems. We're doing that, we're keeping up internally, but we also needed something. Uh, I thought maybe we could buy something off the shelf. Boy, was I wrong. I mean, most of the off the shelf limbs products only do food or only do environmental, like you said, one area, not all these together. So after some, after losing a lot of money, basically trying to do a couple of limbs and implementations, we're in year three of building our own system with a partner that we're going to build from scratch that works, that looks at our processes and can handle the, the sample volumes that we we have and the matrices. We have over, gosh, probably close to 5,000 methods. And so that's a lot. And then to, we want to build it in such a way we can measure the costs of all those different analytes going into those tests. So it is, um, there's a lot more detail there. And I'm, I'm excited the fact that we're building it ourselves after trying to do it again through some uh, major, one of these major limbs corporations. So it's it's challenged, as you said, it's very challenging. I wish you had, you had known me back then because my first custom made limb systems was done in 2001 <laughs> because of the same reason, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, especially if you have a multidiscipline laboratory, right? Like one of our largest clients experienced the same problem and, and uh, they did all the research and they decided to hire us to build their lean system. And that was uh, nine years ago. And we're still, we're still building out the system as they grow exponentially. We add more modules. And, and if you look at the, 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 the licensing cost and the customization cost compared to what they got and knowing that is their intellectual property, they made a fortune just by investing in their custom software, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because now you're going to own the, the intellectual property too, which is going to add value to your company. The other, in the other avenue, you're you're doing a, a capital expenditure that is not adding anything but just an expense to your to your bottom line. Right, right, right. exactly, exactly. Uh, Brent, tell me when you decided to start to change, what what made you make that decision and take that leap of faith to to start to? Well, start to uh, 
Probably the biggest learning for me was I thought I could solve these things through technology because everything was changing pretty fast again at that time uh, with systems and uh, the ones we had built. But the missing piece, I was really, I had my, I had my processes out of order. I was seeking technology first when I, in fact, um, the person I work with closely today, uh, Dana Berkey, our chief strategy officer, she pointed me in a great direction and said, you know, Brent, you need to really think of these three words, people, process, and technology in that order, always. And she was absolutely right. You got to get the people thing first, and then you got to have processes to be, become consistent. And then technology becomes much, much easier once once those first two items are in place. So people, process, and technology, I, th I refer to that, um, those three words all the time. And um, that's how we grew from 90. We actually were woefully undermanned for the volume of samples we were running. And that's how we started to go from uh, 100 employees to almost 300, is that we, we needed more people to actually do the work in effective manner. And uh, not and in a way that we could build processes um, mm -hmm. into the into place that on a consistent on a consistent um, basis and maintain the instrumentation and just do things from a consistency standpoint. We needed the, that many people, and so that was really what really changed. But in the beginning, yeah, I was very reactive. I did things off the cuff, and um, I was turning even our own employees away. From the way i was leading so that was that was not a good healthy way to lead a company and i quickly learned my mistakes in doing so well when was so number one you hit the bullseye on success people process technology and this has to be in that order that's why my company is 19 years old because we know that and you know i know that because a computer scientist if you don't know that you will never be a good computer scientist i mean Every time I go into a new project, the first thing that I do is I analyze the people and fix the people problems. Then I improve the processes. And right after that, then we start with the technology. But a lot of people want to start with the technology first. And all they do is waste time, money, and, and resources because technology is not going to solve anything if your processes are wrong and if your people don't have the right mindset. Right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, but when did you took the role of CEO? When was that day? That, that was two thousand. Yeah, two thousand sixteen. So my dad and his two, his two partners retired, and then it was my dad and myself. Uh, he he was always in the operations, even until he left in twenty twenty at the age of eighty. Um, so the two of us, after his two partners retired, he kind of also had a bunch of things he wanted to do or accomplish before, you know, he left the business. And I don't think he actually knew how to leave. This was his baby. He started this, you know, in 1975. And I think he was, there was a lot of concerns that how are we gonna keep this thing going? And um, rightfully so. So, um, so the two of us worked together. And what I saw was, you know, a person constantly in the, in the operations all the time. And it wasn't really until I told you, you know, I was very reactive. I was so reactive that I brought people from the outside in to you know to lead the i thought that would be the fastest way to get up to speed on things when in fact i was ultimately destroying the culture by bringing people from the outside who didn't understand our culture who were trying to make decisions too fast who weren't involving our people and finally it took some scientists to step up and say hey if you don't do something here we're all going to walk because mm -hmm. these people you brought in are not working so after two months i had a, an attorney walk these guys out and i started all over and the way we started over was we pulled out that mission and vision that was in a drawer and we rewrote our mission, our vision and our core values that our leadership team did. We all had to be, we agreed, we all had to be on the same page that this was gonna work and trust was gonna be at the center of that. And that's where the transformation really started was when we actually sat down and really mapped out a plan for the company. And that was huge, that was hu so huge. It's admirable, Brent, because uh, it takes a level of humility to realize that you made a mistake, especially when you are at the top of the company. A lot of the times I, I made mistakes and I didn't want to recognize them because I didn't want to look like a fool to my to the people that reported to me. Yeah. And by hiding those mistakes, I made huge problems that almost got my businesses bankrupt. 
Uh, so it took a long time for me. It's, it's crazy because I am a man of faith, but I left, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and I left my faith for a while while I was trying to to grow my companies and become rich. So I, I fell in love with money. And when you do that, ego grows too. And that's when you start hiding stuff, right? Because you were supposed to be the best guy and nobody is supposed to know that you have faults. And when the Lord humbled me in a way that I couldn't turn away except back to the cross, that's when my humility came into my life and everything started to change and my people started to react better. Because like you, in two months, they told you you're making a mistake and you were humble enough to say, you know, guys, you guys, you know what? You're right. Let's start from scratch and let's rebuild this company, right? Yeah, yeah. And to your point, and I think faith was a huge component during that time too. I, I lost my mom to cancer and I'll never forget, I did not want my dad to be alone on her birthday. So my dad and I went to a conference and we walked into this coffee shop and on this board on this coffee shop, it said, how can we pray for you? And I looked at my dad and I said, I think mom's trying to tell us something here. And so if you walk into our main entrance here at our building, there is a prayer wall on the wall there where any employee, client, any guest can write whatever petition or item that they want prayed for. And it was a way of for me to, to really connect with faith and get, again, show the people that in a non-invasive way, um, non-threatening ways, like here's an opportunity. If you've got some real problem and you want somebody to, who doesn't want to be prayed for, yeah. um, here's a way to do that. If you've got a real issue and you need some help. So that was really the start of how I think I've tried to reconnect again with the employees. That's beautiful that you have prayer as part of your, as part of your culture. No wonder you're successful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, going to steal say, that from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that one. And then the, I think the other piece that that really led me to was calling people by their name. I think I learned in corporations, we never, I never heard my name called. I'd see it in emails or documents, but when you call and really address people by their name, they stop. Everyone wants to hear their name called. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, even our 300 employees, I try my best. I don't know everybody's name, but I want to learn everybody's name here because that again shows a connectivity or a personalization. When you when you lead off with someone's name, you've made the conversation personal. You're showing, you're stopping to show that you care and you want to be focused and listen to what their needs are. That's actually a respect. Um, when you show respect, you, you get it back in return. It's, you know, like it's, it's, it's exactly what the Bible says, right? You you shall reap what you sow. Exactly. I actually do that when I go to restaurants. I make I made it a habit, and I'm very bad with names, but you know. Uh, when I go to a restaurant, I ask the server's name, he, and then I introduce myself. So I, I tell him or her my name, my name, and then the whole conversation when they come and serve us, I always make sure I call them by name. And you will not believe how beautiful that that interaction is. You know? It is absolutely it is. Brent, how did you survive COVID? Did you guys have to shut down? No, we never shut down. Uh, that was again. I, we just uh, we had just put our mission, vision, and core values in place in January. We're ready to roll it out in February, and then March hits. March of 2020. I'll never forget. And all of a sudden, here comes COVID. What do we do? And because we had put made our COVID core value that people were going to be first, we took safety at the highest level. So the first thing we did was. Um, if you remember with COVID, uh, we got masks. We got masks really early on. We had to order them overseas and uh, we spread the day out. There was this thing called social distancing, if you remember that. Yeah, well, it our, was horrible. Our, our buildings are so tight. We had to start the day at 5.30 in the morning and we went to 11 o'clock at night. We had to stretch out the day because we had too many people too close to each other. Mm -hmm. And um, we made it a point that if you did get COVID, you stayed home, you were paid but we wanted to really make sure safety was first. And so we really took that, I think by taking that again, and we really connected with the employees because that lab people can't work from home. They have to come into the, they have to come to yeah. work. There's no going, there's no working from home. We didn't even have work from home before COVID. Now our office people can work, there's, they, there's some hybrid pieces there, but lab people had to come to work. And mm -hmm. so I think I told, I think I stayed home a total of maybe two weeks and then I had to get, come back to work. I didn't think it was right that our lab people were coming to work and here I was, I was at home. But yeah. um, 
we stayed open through that. Um, we got PPP money, like uh, um, from the government, but we didn't use a dime. We gave it all back because we were doing so well. Um, but we did. We spread out the day. We really took people first. Uh, obviously, we had cases of COVID and stuff, and people had to stay home. But we wiped down the door handles. We did all the, you know, we did everything that you could again to protect the people, and really practice sanit hand sanit. Uh, sanitization sorry i can't say the word and then um i think by again by doing that there was a level of you know we're going to stay open as an essential business for food safety and water safety and we're going to do everything we can to stay in business because nobody knew there was no playbook for covid and our covid handbook i think went from like a couple pages to over 200 pages by the time we were done we just kept wow. writing on the fly with different procedures and how we were going to handle things so um, it was really, I would say for our leadership team, it was really, everything got accelerated. I think our whole culture got accelerated as to how we were going to work with employees, what was going to, what were we going to value first, which would give us people and how we're we going to do that. We had all kinds of processes that we had to put in place because of COVID. Um, did you get a slowdown from your clients? Like, did you notice any in your, in your receivables a change? You know, ours, we actually grew. It's so funny that we did. We actually wow. had our revenues grew. I think it was because the ag sector is so strong. Farmers didn't care. They still needed to get their crops in place. So agriculture kind of is resilient in that sense. Um, water testing, food test. I mean, there was still food being produced. So I think by being in this sector, we really avoided all the, the closing of different clients or the reduced revenue so we really didn't we didn't see that at all which was again it is amazing when you think about that oh you, you were blessed i remember back in 2020 half of my clients were in manufacturing and i lost half of the revenue in two days <laughs> we even we even went so far we knew we were busting at the seams here we even bought a building november of 2020 um, this data center that had almost a thousand employees at one time left everything. And we bought this data center that was a 176,000 square foot building. And they left their desks, their chairs, all their cubicles. Um, and we bought this building for pennies on the dollar. We were either very smart or we just decided at that point, let's take a chance. We'll take a risk here. And that's where we're again, at some point we're gonna move to this new campus. Uh, but yeah, we bought a building during COVID. I mean, who did that? Who bought real estate during during that time yeah. too? It's amazing because uh, wow, this is one of the lessons that I that I learned too. In in hard times, some companies really prosper. If you look at the Fortune 100 companies, a lot of them were were built out of uh, financial crises, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So no, we've, we've been very fortunate and we've been continuing, I would say for the last five years, we've been double digit uh, as far as growth, as far as sales. So we have really continued to accelerate that. And I really think that's the culture. Yeah, as you said earlier, you'll grow faster with people. And once you have people's backs um, and they know that they'll do, they'll do the extra things for you. I've, mm -hmm. I've just really learned that. It's really, it's really amazing to watch seen how the culture has changed over the last five or six years here. That's beautiful. Brent, what's in the future for, for your business? What, what would you like to do from like five yeah. years from now? I'm going to, oh, what? Well, a couple things. I mean, you talked about a succession plan. I used to think those words were terrible. Uh, I know my dad did too at, at some point. I'm really embracing it. I'm, I'm looking at 10 years, you know, 10 years out. I'm starting to build that um, now for my kids. And for the employees, they want to see where the company's going. I see us again, moving to this new campus and again, doing uh, great things. We're in 12 different buildings right now. We have to walk outside. It's very, it's very disjointed, I will say. So I'm very excited to get into a, um, into a campus or a building where we can really set the processes and find a lot of efficiencies. But mm -hmm. I still see that the world of testing is really uh, lots of opportunity there. That's fantastic, Brent. Um, what would you suggest somebody that uh, was thinking about going into their family business, but not so sure if whether they should do it or not? What would you recommend to a person like that? Find it in your heart to really decide if you've got that. Um, do you have that entrepreneurial, 
entrepreneurial spirit. I know it's a second generation ownership, but I feel like we're a 40, we've been around 48 years or 49, yeah, almost 49 years. I feel like it's a 49 year old startup. I just really feel like we're constantly cleaning up processes or we're doing different things to get in place. But if you've got the, um, if you got the wherewithal that you want to take somebody's legacy and build on it, like I did, and it becomes a passion of yours, it'll drive you. You'll you'll get to the next level, but you got to really want it. Um, I have no plans to sell. I do not want to sell because I know once I sell or I bring others involved, the culture is going to have an impact. I don't want this culture to. I want to keep it growing. I want to keep people first, and um, I know that's in the back of a lot of people's minds because the way the world, most of the world today, you just if you go so far and then you sell your company. Yeah. I just really don't want to do that if I don't have to. I really want to, I like what's being built and we continue to build on that piece. That's beautiful, Brent. And you know what? Uh, you don't have to. I mean, what the, what society tells on us, it doesn't it doesn't have to apply to us, right? right? You know, I was being told all the time, you have to be willing to sell at any moment and you have to be willing to sell. I'm like, I love what I do and I love my people. And it took me 20 years to build what I have, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I run the business as if I was going to sell it tomorrow, because exactly. my EBITDA has to be there, all my processes have to be there. The business is run by the, almost by themselves, but that doesn't mean that I want to sell either, right? <laughs> right. No, no. You should you you should set it a goal to make your company sellable, and that takes a lot. To your point, it, and that's a great goal to have. I I totally agree with that. Let me give you an example too, like what something we're doing this year that really will be, it's going to be impactful. If I say the words healthcare, do you just like, oh, do you shudder every time you hear healthcare costs? Yeah. Our healthcare costs, we're self-insured, went up 400%. We have, right now we have low deductibles. If you're a single, if you're an individual, your in, health insurance is paid for. So when it went up 400%, we worked with our broker and he said, Basically, they said, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta pass all these costs to your employees. You gotta raise deductibles. You gotta raise copays." And we, we kept looking at them and said, "Well, that's not gonna fix the issue." I said, "What's bringing the cost down?" And if you look in the healthcare industry, there's nothing. There's no incentive to bring costs down. Mm -hmm. So we we looked at it for about eight months, and we found a company here in town that did not want to work with insurance companies. Doctors and nurses had their own model. And so what we've done is we've opened a medical clinic on site for our employees where we have doctors and nurses three times a week and that primary care costs, there's no cost to them or their families. And they have it right here on site when they work. And because what we were finding is they were going to the doctor after hours, urgent cares, hospital, emergency rooms, and driving the costs up. So by bringing it on site, we're hopefully, we're gonna drive the costs down and um, hopefully bring them again and more convenience to them as well. So those type of things I get really excited about because we're, we're trying to find ways, like, as you say, thinking outside the box yeah. that we can really bring value to our employees, not only from a cost standpoint, but from a convenience and a health standpoint. We, let's get preventive, you know, let's stop being reactive all the time. Let's, let's do some preventive things too. So it's a very Imagine exciting it. time. It's incredible. Imagine if everybody will think like that way. And I bet that's 80, 80 to 90 percent of the cases are just going to the doctor's office and prevent something that is horrible, right? Right, right, exactly. That's beautiful. Ben, thank you so much for your time. I don't want to abuse it. Let's finish this podcast with one last question. OK. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on Earth, uh, what would you write? What would I write? Um... I would say leading from the heart is the best way to live. Leading from the heart. Wow, that's beautiful. And I can truly see how you're doing that with your life because you're, you know, Bible says that by your works, you will notice them. And that's exactly what you're doing. You have a beautiful company. You're bringing healthcare inside. You're growing. You're set to keep going. Um, I pray that you, you want to keep blessing other people, that your kids might get enticed to come into the business because that's never a, that's, that's never a, a sure factor. It wasn't for you. It took you 20 years to come back. Exactly. Right? exactly. But you know, your employees will love if somebody, somebody comes in and, and takes over you eventually and just keep it growing, right? Right, exactly. Very good. 
Thank you so much for your time, Brett. If people would like to find out more about you or, or get involved with your business, how can they find you? Yeah, uh, CEO of your heart.com or on LinkedIn, either one. Uh, again, on LinkedIn, I'm really trying to, um, I, put, I try to post a lot of things, both uh, from a faith standpoint and a leadership standpoint. I think leadership is so critical as shows like this, we need more leaders now more than ever. And I, I can't stress that enough. Beautiful. Ben, thank you so much. God bless you. Have a beautiful rest of the week. All right. Thank you, David. All right. Blessings. Cheers. That's all for today's episode of the Break Free Podcast. Head on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. Starting your own business can be tough, but it doesn't have to be. Visit davidmansilla.com to pick up a copy of the number one international best-selling book, Breaking Out of Corporate Jail. Expand what you consider to be possible and reach your full potential. And join us on the next episode.